father and mother, that person is also worshipable. So he worships the Lord, worships his son, and he's going to make some other pronouncements. Prior to this, it's important, uh, the previous chapter, 23, Devahuti is lamenting, that's the title of the chapter, that we've spent such long time together and I've not taken advantage of all that your association could afford, I've not taken advantage of liberation. Yesterday we spoke about this liberation idea. So he doesn't mean you know, the, the neutrality, merging kind of liberation, but the positive liberation, being engaged, ultimate liberation, being engaged in perfect service to the Supreme Lord. In the beginning of this chapter, Cardamoni says, don't lament. Uh, very soon, the personality of Godhead is going to appear as your son, and he will give you that by his teachings of Sankhya and perfected devotion and service. So now, here we are. Kapila Dev is within the womb of <coughs> Devahuti, who will soon become the son of Kardama and Devahuti. And Brahma is uh, about to speak. Text 11. After worshipping the Supreme Lord with gladdened senses and a pure heart for his, that's Kapila Dev's, intended activities as an incarnation, Brahma spoke as follows to Kardama and Devahuti. <coughs> Purport for text 11. As explained in Bhagavad Gita 4th chapter, anyone who understands the transcendental activities, appearance and disappearance of the Supreme Personality Godhead is to be considered liberated. Brahma, therefore, is a liberated soul. Although he is in charge of this material world, he is not exactly like the common living entity since he is liberated from the majority of the follies of the common living entities he was in knowledge of the appearance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and he therefore worshipped the Lord's activities. And, with a glad heart, he also praised Kardava Muni, because the Supreme Personality of Godhead, as Kapila, had appeared as his son, when he had become the father of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is certainly a great devotee. There is a verse spoken by a Brahmana, in which he says that he does not know what the Vedas and the Pranas are, but while others might be interested in the Vedas and the Pranas, he is interested in Nanda Maharaj, who appeared as the father of Krishna. The Brahmana wanted to worship Nanda Maharaj because the Supreme Personality of Godhead as a child crawled in the yard of his house. These are some of the good sentiments of devotees. If a recognized devotee brings forth the Supreme Personality of Godhead as his son, he should be praised! Exclamation point. Rama, therefore, not only worshipped the incarnation of Godhead Kapila, but also praised his so-called father, Kardamamuni. And here's how he starts his praise, text 12. Lord Rama said, My dear son, Kardama, because that's the relationship father-son. His son is going to have, as his son, the Supreme Lord. My dear son, Karma, since you have completely accepted my instructions without duplicity, showing them proper respect, you have worshipped me properly. Whatever instructions you took from me you have carried out, and thereby you have honored me. Important. Message and purport. Lord Brahma, as the first living entity within the universe, is supposed to be the spiritual master of everyone, and 
He is also the Father, the Creator of all beings. Kardamamuni is one of the Prajapatis, or creators of living entities, and he is also a son of Brahma. Brahma praises Kardama because he carried out the orders of the spiritual master in toto and without cheating. A conditioned soul in the material world has disqualifications, he has the disqualification of cheating. He has four disqualifications. He is sure to commit mistakes, he is sure to be illusion, he is prone to cheat others, and his senses are imperfect. But if one carries out the order of the spiritual master by disciplic succession or the parampara system, he overcomes the four defects. Therefore, knowledge received from the bona fide spiritual master is not cheating. Any other knowledge which is manufactured by the conditioned soul is cheating only. Brahma knew well that Karmauni exactly carried out the instructions received from him, Brahma, and that he, Karnava, actually honored his spiritual master. To honor the spiritual master means to carry out his instructions word for word. So, uh, a few points quickly. Uh, that the word that's used in the verses nirvyalika or nirvyalikata. This is with the way the Prabhupada is translated it here is without duplicity. And um, it's a nice word, it's an important word that's used in maybe a dozen places in the Bhagavatam. Without pretense, without duplicity, without sin, it has these different meanings, with, with full sincerity. So it has, a lot, it has a lot to do with our topic yesterday, the Anartanavritti topic. Because it's, <clears throat> we may be here and our goal is there, and Anartanavritti is to remove obstacles so we can get to where we want to go. And then there's the struggle of being attached to what we don't want because it's in our heart and we're attached to it. And so, there, so there's unsteadiness because of that. And then the, the sincerity is we're very clear what we want. And we're not just saying it. This is this nirvulika. It's without duplicity. We say it because we mean it or go back. We mean it. Like we know inside, deep inside, there is a hankering. Now, the hankering has a mix. And nirvilika is one come to the point where there's no mix. Although I may not be there yet, I'm ready to let go. No. Of those things that are holding me to the material conception of life. Mainly, the, the, the main force is our hankering to be in the position of Krishna. Our hankering to be the enjoyer, the Purusha, whether in a male body or female body, the Purusha, the enjoyer. We don't want to let go of that. We want to be happy, we don't want to let go of it because that's our notion of being happy and if we let go of that then where's our happiness? So we're left with nothing. That's the, the Buddhist conception, you know, so they like it, let's, let's have nothing and then we won't have suffering, we won't have misery. <laughs> not easy. It's not natural. Because we want happiness, not just cessation of misery. Mm -hmm. We want happiness. We're holding on to the conception arising out of envy of he who was actually the enjoyer. So it's not embracing the 
deepest part of our heart, the, the position of Krishna should be the enjoyer. Anakoyena, Rupa Goswami's definition of bhakti. Anakoyena, really nice understanding. Such a simple. Anyadi lashra shinyam jnana karma jnavatram anakoyena. Krishna Rushilana Bhakti or Uttama Bhakti is Uttama Bhakti. Uttama Bhakti is I want Krishna to be to be pleased. It's, it's, it's a hankering, a cultivation of our natural state of love. Where the happiness is the beloved's happiness. That's our happiness. And we hold on to something else. And that's this Vyalika. I want to be Krishna's devotee because I want my happiness. <laughs> I want my misery to end and I want you know, everything to be nice. And because there are certainly people that go in the other direction, well, well everything's not nice, but I'm, I'm nice. I'm a good devotee. Why are bad things happening? And so forth. So, near Vyalika, there's three parts to this. Nirvilika is Brahma's appreciating that Kardama has followed his instruction without duplicity. Now, his instruction was, please assist me in creating good praja. Because Brahma's created the universe, he's requested his son as a prajapati, a father of mankind, to produce living entities good ones. And so it was, yes, sir, yes, father. And because Karma was such an elevated devotee, he wanted not just children to assist his father, but he wanted the personality of God as his son. So Brahma's appreciating he did this without duplicity. Now this word nirvilika is used when there's, here's some other usages from the Bhagavatam. Lord Brahma comes before Lord Vishnu on behalf of the demigods, they're behind him, saying to Lord Vishnu, I have worshipped you near Vilika. So Brahma has that qualification, he therefore can recognize one who has that qualification, Karna. And in First Cantor chapter 4, Vyasadeva, excuse me, yeah, Vyasadeva is speaking to Narada about his compiling of the Vedas, and he said, this near Vyalika word, I, I worship the Vedas without pretense, and therefore I was able to uh, have full knowledge of the Vedas, and, and now I'm in the position to write them down, and yet I'm feeling some, some difficulty, some imperfection some discomfort. And that was, of course, not because he was defective, it was because it was part of the plan of Nard to come to instruct him and so forth. And then do a rewrite on the Bhagavad Purana, revision number two, or version number two, because the initial was already compiled. So, near Vilika. And this, this example that's in the the purport here is one brahmana says, people may say, I know the Vedas and Puranas, as far as I'm concerned I don't, but I know one thing, Nanda Maharaj is to be worshipped. Because in the courtyard of Nanda Maharaj, the personality God is crawling in his courtyard. So, this is the a very beautiful poetic way of saying the same thing near Vilika. What's the goal of the Vedas? It's to know Krishna. And one can know Krishna by this method of honoring that which is dear to Krishna. That's the, that's the way of approaching Krishna, of becoming, that this is part of this near Vilika message. Second is... Um, Prabhupada takes in the purport, he flips it around the other way, 
and says that the instructions of such a person as Brahma is without pretense. One is the follower, the other is the preceptor, and then the, the, the teachings of one who is near Vilika is um, not compromised. Knowledge received for bona fide spiritual master is not cheating. So this cheating, what go back to the earlier part of the purport, is um, connected to this idea of duplicity. Without duplicity. Duplicity is say one thing, do another thing. It's duplicity and people have a problem, rightly so, with you say one thing, do another thing. So one who is, go the other direction, one who is worthy of your trust is, there's no duplicity. They don't say one thing and do another thing. Like Prabhupada would explain it this way, if, the, if a teacher says, don't do as I do, but do as I say. Then, you know, excuse me. He, then you give the example. The teacher is speaking some high philosophy, and then after teaching, he goes and smokes a cigarette. <laughs> An example that Prabhupada was giving. You know, if he can't control the senses and he's teaching spiritual subjects, how can he know spiritual subjects? It's cheating. Duplicity. So one should not hear from such a person. I mean, yeah. Okay. So back to the message of the purport. Brahma's message is worth hearing because it's from that place where there's the message itself is without cheating. The person who's hearing is has the capacity. And so he's using Prabhupada's language here. Karma followed it, his, his instruction in toto. In toto is a Latin term. In total, without without missing anything, without editing anything out, and the fullness was there. And he just did what his he was requested to do in, in submission to his father. Of course, submission to his father in service to Lord Vishnu, who wanted Brahma to do the service of creating and then filling up the universe. So, the Prajapati's son, Karma, was doing exactly that, which is very pleasing to Lord Vishnu, and therefore, Lord Vishnu has appeared as his son, because that was his specific desire of service, in addition to fulfilling the desire of his father. And, <coughs> last point is, is this one. Uh, we spoke about this not yesterday, but day before on Saturday. The, the Balade Vidyabhusan's commentary on Bhagavad Gita 241 is this Vyavasayat Nika Bodhi, this very singular attention, which is same here. To honor the spiritual master means to carry out his instruction word for word, without getting deviated, without getting distracted. Um, is taking the instructions of the spiritual master as one's life and soul, and that's the that's the rocket fuel. That, that's what can propel one beyond material existence, to the other side of material existence, into the spiritual realm. You know what a catapult is? You heard that? You know what it is? No, I know it. What is it? Say it. Look, it's something that you swing something over. Yes. Let's just say, here's a long stick. And here's an object that's captured in a bowl or something at the end of a long stick. And 
you pull the stick back and back and back, put some object and then release and the catapult sends the object flying some distance. You can look it up later. Catapult. Bhakti is like that. There's a, there's, I'll end with this. One of my godbrothers recently was describing japa in a similar way. He's using a, a bow and arrow, similar. And that is, for the bow and arrow, like Ram strung the bow of Lord Shiva, and then again Lord Vishnu. When he strung the bow of Lord Vishnu, he put an arrow. He said, now, Parashuram, where do I release this arrow? So you need a target. So for a life of devotion, you need a target, and the target has the center, not just hit the target. You, you're much more likely to hit the target if you are aiming at the center. And Arjuna, you know this from Mahabharata, he not only, the target that was identified by his teacher Drona, not only saw the target, but he saw the eye, and he could, couldn't see anything else. He could only see the eye, because that was the target. So, here's the Maha Mantra, or here's a life of devotion to Krishna, and you pull back the bow, and you have to be very clear what the target is, and then you have to let go. This is an Arjuna Vritti. You let go of attachment to the temporary and trying to be the enjoyer to the, of the temporary. If you don't let go, how can you progress? The Anartha Nivriti process will be very slow. Unless there's a willingness to let go. The effect of the Maha Mantra will be diminished. There's effect. Unless one is willing to let go. The Mantra has the potency to take away everything but pure devotion. We have to be, there's a willingness to let go. There's something on our side and there's something on Krishna's side. There's the mercy from Krishna and there's the willingness to receive the fullness of Krishna's mercy. And that a manifestation of that is willingness to let go. Willingness to let go doesn't mean you give away possessions. It means stopping thinking to, to diminish and terminate the, the notion that I'm meant to be the enjoyer of my paraphernalia. Stuff. And Happiness is dependent upon how much stuff, and unhappiness is my stuff is being taken by circumstance or a hurricane or some something. Another child comes and wants to play with my toys, and I don't want to have another child play with my toys because they're my toys. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the things that parents need to do is help children understand that, you know, you share your toys. You can have some sense that they're my toys, that's all right, but it's actually Krishna's toys and you share it because that's what you do when you live in this world. But you, you start to learn as a child and then become an adult and everything actually belongs to Krishna. And we're, we have what is meant for us and the rest is meant for Krishna's service. It's actually all Krishna's. So letting go of the false sense of proprietorship means it's only possible if you recognize who is the proprietor. But you can't recognize who is the proprietor unless you let go of misconception. Well, actually, I'm the proprietor of this much. We're the manager, and we're utilizing this much, but it's not ours. I and mind consciousness, aham mameti, you won't get the full effect of maha mantra chanting and a life of devotion. The letting go part has to be there, and it starts with how we chant the holy name and all the other activities of devotional service. 
So back to the verse and we're done. Um, Brahma is appreciating the karma you've done it. Dear Velika. And so, because you're so purified by that, you're beyond the Narta Nabriti stage. You're in the perfect stage. Therefore, the son, the, as your son, the personality of God has appeared. You're to be honored. I honor you for that achievement. You've pleased me very much. And he's one who can give benedictions, and he does. Okay, so any discussion? Oh, yes. Um, I was uh, re reading about different devotees from the first canto and this concept of about letting it go. So many of the examples, uh, like Sri Narad Muni, then Maharaj Yudhishthir, then Maharaj Parikshir, then um, when the time of death came, they literally let go of their kingdoms and their possessions and they focused their entire attention on Krishna. But what are the lessons we can draw while they were living uh, and they were possessing all of, the, all of these things? They dedicated those things to Krishna. It's a stage. I mean, what, what, take Grandfather Bhishma. When he was instructing, he instructed. And then at a certain stage, he relinquished that activity of extending his senses into the field of the object of the senses, and he withdrew them. That's the Pratyahara stage. And he fixed, but it wasn't before that, he wasn't, didn't have his mind completely fixed. So the, 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 the message of Bhagavad Gita is, before that final stage, engage in your prescribed duty and always think of me. Two things. It's not that they didn't always think of Krishna before the final stage. They were always thinking of Krishna before the final stage. And they were engaged in their prescribed duty. And when that time of death came, they withdrew the duty part and just fixed it. They had, it was perfect. That's what we practice. So basically only somebody practices during the lifetime can do it even later. Yes. Yes. That's, our, that's the essence of the whole nectar devotion or, you know, the, the, the performance of sadhana, I should say, which is mold your life in such a way that you always remember Krishna. And then there's the prohibition, and never forget Krishna. It's very powerful. Mold your life, so that's, that includes when chanting japa, it includes when you're doing RT it includes when you're in the kitchen, it includes when you're with your family members, it includes when you're doing your occupation, it includes when you're doing your homework, it includes everything. Mold your life in such a way. And that, that's not easy, because, you know, when we're doing something, how do you think of Krishna? You know, you're sitting there in your, in your workstation at the, at the work, and, you know, wait a minute, i got to be thinking of Krishna. So, it's, it's attachment brings the mind to the object, even when you're doing something. It's not distracted. It's attentive to the purpose behind this occupation or this study. It's, it's to please Krishna. And I may not immediately see the connection as I'm doing my homework, sitting there, you know, doing some math problems or studying history or something. What's the connection with Krishna? It's, there's minimally, minimally, there's intellectual skills that I'm developing by doing this that can be used in Krishna's service. Now the teacher in the classroom may not be thinking that's what the student is up to, but the student is, that's what they're up to. And so forth. That it's for whom are we doing what we're doing? That's the, the mind goes to Krishna part. Out of Koyena, Krishna should be pleased. Something else? Yes? Um, we were talking about the being uh, steadfast of no duplicity. Mm. 
uh, my perceive or my understanding is uh, that cause that is caused because due to the influence of mode of ignorance, which is caused uh, the being duplicit dupli uh, duplicitous. Well, it's a combination, passion uh, and ignorance. So, uh, uh, at any uh, situation, how do we counter that mode well, of ignorance? You take your attention to Krishna. Light dismisses darkness. Yeah. Yes. Um, Hare Krishna Maharaj, what's the difference between a sin and an offense? Well, we discussed it yesterday, and the, and the distinction I gave was a functional one. Sin, functional distinction is, sin is something that can be overcome by bhakti. Bhakti has the power to dismiss sin. Whereas, functionally different is offense and its consequent anartha in the heart has the power to block the power of bhakti. It's more difficult. Now, a, 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 another way of defining the distinction is dharma, we discussed it yesterday, Dharma is how you should conduct your life. And one who conducts their life according to the laws of Dharma, the laws of proper conduct, that's Dharma. And then those that violate that or neglect that, that's sin. <coughs> that's a definition. Over here is that which is spiritual, I don't regard as spiritual. That's an offense. So Dharma isn't necessarily in and of itself spiritual, like, you know, cleanliness. It says cleanliness is next to godliness, but that's a dharmic principle. Take a bath and brush your teeth in the morning. Clean your room and keep your things neat and clean. Dharma. Spiritual is the Maha Mantra and the scripture and the deity and the, the place of pilgrimage and bhakti itself and the devotees and devotion and the spirit soul that's within every form of life, the tree and the bird and the fish and the animal and other people, devotees or non-devotees. There's a spiritual spark within. And if I don't recognize and honor the spiritual essence of the, all those things, then I'm going to, that's an, that, that mentality is an offensive mentality, I'm going to do things that are offensive. Okay? Yes? Yeah. Related to this, uh, thoughts about Krishna during the final stages. Talks about Krishna? Thought. Thoughts, thoughts about, about Krishna. Krishna during the final stages. In the final so, stages, yes, of like, like leading to death. Yes. Okay. So when a person is in that stage, a person may be aware of Krishna and our God, like from India, or a person somewhere here who's not aware about Krishna. So when they are hitting their final stages, uh, we 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 at, we suggest that you know we they hear these chanting, either a person doing or we can put Prabhupada yes. chanting. Yes. Yes. So would it, um, actually the conscious should be on Krishna, right? So external hearing, would it be helpful for Yes, them? because it goes to the soul immediately. Okay. Even if they're in a coma. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just Thank you. Yes. At the time of death, even though if you don't do anything related to Krishna, that your soul go back to Krishna anyway? Well, it depends. It's up to Krishna. The rule that Krishna can make exceptions to the rule. The rule is, whatever your mind is fixed on, that's where you go. The exception to the rule is, here's a nice devotee. And this nice devotee 
they've served me so earnestly and sincerely and honestly and over such a long period of time. And due to circumstance, their mind is not on me. Krishna may intervene and enter the mind of that devotee and take them to him. Prabhupada explains like that. So, it's something like <coughs> going to school or not going to school. Mm -hmm. And not going to school, I just expect the school is going to give me an honorary degree. I completed studies and they give me a certificate. You're a graduate of our school. Mm -hmm. It can happen. Schools do that sometimes. But don't count on it. Don't live your life that way. You go to school. You enroll, take the exams, and get your certificate. So Krishna can intervene. He can... St but so what we should do is we practice remembering Krishna, serving Krishna, devoting ourselves to Krishna because we want that. Now, supposing at the end of such a devotee's life, at the moment of death their mind is not fixed on Krishna. Krishna can intervene. Because he loves his devotee, as the devotees love him. He's very kind. That's why we love him. He's so kind. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the past I've heard from you that um, it is the commentary of Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. Yes, yes I have checked and it's Bhavadeva. Oh, six, I don't know. Probably. Yeah. <clears throat> All demigods, whatever we ask, they are fulfilling immediately. But if we go not to always. Vishnu... Not always. <laughs> he is not uh, interested to give. More easily, yeah. That's why in our Calcutta, most of the people, yeah, totally. they are going to demigod. They, are, they does yeah. not yeah. want to see Krishna and all. Right. Why? Krishna should give all this power to him. Yeah. Well, <coughs> um, there's a verse in the fifth canto, I believe it's fifth canto, where Krishna says, I'm not such a fool. These people are coming to me with material desire, and if I fulfill their material desire, they just become more entangled in material activity. I'm not such a fool, I'm not going to give them those things. Then he goes on and says, but if I do give them those things, I'll do it in such a way they'll become freed from that desire because I'll give my two lotus feet. And when I give my two lotus feet, those other desires are gone. So even when I give them, Dhruva Maharaj, you ha have the kingdom. His attention isn't being the enjoyer of the kingdom. His attention is something else because he received that mercy. That's the merciful nature of Vishnu or Krishna. Okay, see the Prabhupada, Ki, Jai. Yeah. Yeah.